I invite you to stand for the gospel. The gospel lesson is from John chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. Jesus is speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name the Father will give you this is my command love each other you may be seated let's pray so Lord guide our thoughts our hearts all that we have and all that we are that we might understand what it is to be fruitful and uh, we just give you praise and glory Uh, for your word in your holy name. Amen. Well, if you ever had one of those talks where you do it at uh, first and you go, that was not so good, and then you rewrite the whole thing in your head in the meanwhile, that's today. Right? Like like I said, okay, people were gracious. I thought it was okay at 8 o'clock, but but I finally figured out what I need to do because I just want you to get it. I so want you to understand, and I want to ask you a question. What is the difference between grapevines and tomato vines? Anyone? All right, they both bear fruit. Yes, tomatoes are a fruit. All right, we kind of think of them as a veggie, but um, they both bear fruit. Can you go wrong doing tomatoes is, uh, is maybe a really logical question. They are weeds. They are. And, you know, you can not water them and they will die. Okay? But, but, but you can... It's really pretty simple to grow tomatoes. You put them in the ground or in the pot, and you give them a little fertilizer, and you give them regular water, and they will produce um, lots and lots of fruit. That is so not true of grapevines. Now, a tomato vine, it springs up in one year, and if you're in a garden season like Utah, it's going to be done by the longest I've ever picked tomatoes. I did pick one year in uh, Thanksgiving. That was pretty amazing. I actually picked tomatoes on Thanksgiving that were still good. That was an unusual year. Usually they're done a good bit before that first frost kind of does them in. Um, Grapevines are not so. You plant them 
and you nourish them and it will be years before you get good fruit now I had little understanding of this until I bought the place that Don and I live and we have 50 year old grapevines on the back fence and I'm telling you we are really terrible grape gardeners she's agreeing with me she's better than me I'm giving her that Okay, but even the two of us together, we are not so fabulous. It is really rough. First of all, we do we are not we you have to spend about two hours a day to make grapes good. She's nodding her head yes. We don't have two hours a day to make good grapes, okay? And what I'm saying is it is probably one of the most labor intensive things I have ever tried to do. And, you know, you just have to be at it continually. You're cutting off the stuff that's that's not flourishing. You're cutting off the stuff that's flourishing too well but not bearing fruit. And basically you cut back about two-thirds of the growth every year. And I'm kind of heartless at that. Or or I I should say I'm not heartless enough because I, I just... The, you know, I, I don't want to cut them that much. But but if you're going to get good fruit, you're just out there cut, cut, snip, snip all the time. Oy. And then if you want really good fruit, when you're growing a bunch of grapes, you cut the bottom of the bunch off. And it's a lot of work to make this happen. All right. Connect the dots. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Who does the heavy lifting? Who does all the hard work in producing fruit? And I'm going to tell you, it's the gardener. That was just kind of the no-duh thing that hit me between services. It is the gardener who does all that painstakingly loving work to get those vines to give their best. God our Father is the gardener. Jesus is the vine. And it says he's the true vine. And I didn't understand what that meant until you realize there are vines that grow with your grapevines that aren't grapevines at all. They're suckers, and they won't produce any fruit, but they will hog the sun. They will hog the sun and keep the other from producing good fruit. So you got to cut that stuff out and pull it out. And again, lots of labor on the part of the gardener. God is the gardener. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches who need to stay in the vine. So that the vine is is in us and we are in the vine. And, you know, we're talking all about sap. I know, it's a sappy sermon. It's okay. You can tell me this time. Pastor, it was a sappy sermon. All right. Here's the deal. What is sap like? Well, let's change the analogy just a little bit. And sap is like the blood. And if we're going to produce... If we're going to produce the kind of fruit Jesus wants us to produce, it's all about his blood. Right? We're saved by it. We're cleansed by it. <laughs> Everything comes because of the blood of Jesus. He died for us. He rose again. He gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit that he might do what? Move through us. Let his life flow through us that we might produce the kind of fruit he wants to produce. Now, the branches that don't remain in Jesus are pruned off. And you know, one of the most amazing things about pruning branches off of a grapevine is you prune it off, you, you know, you basically let it fall where you can pick it up in a little bit and you keep pruning. And when you go back to pick up those branches, By the time you go to pick them up, they're already so wilted, it's amazing. They're already just shriveling. They don't last very long once they're off the vine. 
And these things are gathered up, and in Jesus' day they were burned, would get arrested if we did that today in the city of Midvale where I live, so uh, they go to the waste. But, wow, it's a quick turnaround, and you better get that stuff up quick, because why? It's going to dry out so much that everything's just going to fall apart. Verses 7 and 8 take us to the heart of what we, we need to see here. The father, the gardener, does all this work. We, flowing with Jesus' sap, knowing his priorities, we know what to pray. We pray, we ask the father, and the father helps us, through the son, be fruitful disciples. Could we have a more intimate picture of God moving us, caring for us, that we might produce fruit. Now the reason that is so important to just get the intimacy of that, and you know, I, I mean the constant care the gardener, the father must give us. The Lord tells us, that he loves us as much as the father loves him now just meditate on it how much does the father love Jesus okay any, any, any thoughts could anybody be more beloved than the son and Jesus says I love you as much as the father loves me now what does that make you Beloved at a, at a at a measure and a, a, a that you can never comprehend. You will never understand how deep and wide, an amazing and thorough and oh, the you know it, it takes us to Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter three, and it's just one of those things where where we cannot ever get the full measure of understanding. Of God's love. And that's who we are. That's how we are. We are loved in a way and a level we will never understand. And we are loved in such a way that if we stay in that love, we will become fruitful in that love. We love because God first loved us. 1 John 4.19. This is the background of 1 John 4.19. We love because he first loved us. And Jesus commands us in verse 12, John 15, love each other as I have loved you. That means we're going to give our lives to and for one another. We're going to agape each other in the most profound ways, loving each other, because that's what our Lord Jesus does for us. And it's because he loves us that much that he says something here which, you know, it, in the ancient world, this would have been just a shock to hear. You know, we take friendship in our culture and it is wafer thin, right? Wafer thin, wafer thin. It is really, really narrow. And, and so how many of you have friends you've never met? Right? Facebook friends. Ay, 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 ay. And, you know, they're, we've emptied the term of meaning. In the ancient world, to have a friend was to have someone you could count on no matter what happened. No matter what time of the day, no matter what time of the night, no matter what the cost, to have someone, to have identified someone, to be in a relationship uh, with them where you called them friend meant you gave your lives to and for one another, even at a cost and at incredible inconvenience. We've just made the whole idea of friendship so lightweight 
in our American culture. There are other cultures where when you call someone a friend, if you do it too soon, they'll be offended at you. Right? They don't take the word as lightly as we do. Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants, I call you friends. And in the ancient world, that would have been astounding to be called a friend of God. To be called Jesus' friend. Wow. Who has more responsibility? The servant or the friend? These servants, they don't even know their master's business. But a friend knows your heart. A friend knows who you are, what you are about, what your priorities are, how you want the world to be, because a friend has been investing in that relationship for a long and wonderful and powerful time. And Jesus calls his friends and he says, I want my joy to be in you and I want your joy to be full. He wants our joy to be full. Now, again, we've got to define the term here because when we think about joy, very often we think about happiness. And these are two, they're not opposites, but they're two things at just profoundly different levels. You see, I can be happy about an ice cream. All right, it's July 5th, it's a hot day. I just, you know, made some ice cream company really happy that I'm talking about that, right? And, and the chances are that you kind of, you get really focused on your favorite flavor of ice cream and, and you can do all kinds of, you know, wonderment and when will this guy get done talking? And, and yeah, 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 I understand. I can be happy about ice cream. I cannot be joyous about ice cream. See, happiness is fleeting. It comes, it goes. It's circumstantial. Joy is something different. Joy is the experience that someone is glad to be with me. And if you're connecting the dots in all of this, Jesus is so glad to be with us that his very sap, his very life is flowing in us. And the Father is so glad to be with us that he is there tending us and pruning and nurturing and doing all those things. And the Holy Spirit is so glad to be with us that he holds nothing from us and he pours forth the love of God into our hearts. Enjoy the experience that someone is glad to be with us is not circumstantial in terms of the things of this world because God does not change. His love does not change. He keeps his promises. Jesus is our Emmanuel, the one who is with us, God with us. And his love as great as the Father loves for him, his love is with us, and he is right now loving you and loving me with that love. He wants us to flourish in that joy, to grow in that joy, to flow with that joy, to have the deepest, most amazing confidence of his love. Because why? So that we will love others. We cannot give what we haven't received. We love because God first loved us. And he is going to love through us. Give us that joy so that we can produce the fruit that will last. We are meant for an intimate relationship with God. 
And as we receive his love, we will continue to love. We will grow in that love and we will share that love. Now let me put this in terms of Romans 5 because Paul really does the same thing um, that Jesus is doing in John 15 when he tells us, well, if I paraphrase it first, the troubles of this life are our opportunity to develop character and to allow the Holy Spirit to pour out God's agape love in us. You see, everything we find in those first two verses in Romans 5, everything we find there is the work of God. Once again, the gardener's doing the heavy lifting. The gardener's doing the work. And everything we have comes because of why? Because Jesus did it for us. It is Jesus who is faithful. It is Jesus who was obedient. It was Jesus who died. It was Jesus who rose again. And it is the faithful God who will, I love it as a promise, who will pour forth his Holy Spirit, his love into our hearts. Wow. Everything we have with God comes to us because Jesus is faithful. Now that means you can look at those times in your life and even the time of your life now where you may be suffering and you can say, thank you, Lord, you are with me. Thank you, Lord, you have used that time. Thank you, Lord, I did not understand it then. I do not understand it for the most part now. But I know, I know because of your love that you have used my suffering to grow my perseverance. You are using perseverance to develop character in me and you are using character and growing this character in me that I might be a person of hope and being a person of hope, I would dare to love and let your love flow through me. And so it is a promise that the Holy Spirit pours out agape love into our hearts with a purpose to love and to bless others. Now, I could ask some really awkward questions, but I just, you know, play with this however your mind wants to, to, to deal with it. If God is pouring his love into you and you are not flowing it, letting it flow anywhere, what's going to happen? <laughs> you just, you get, you get this idea of James ballooning and ballooning and ballooning and ballooning and, and hopefully, oh God, yeah, I better let it flow, right? Because I don't want to pop, right? You, if God's going to pour his love into us, we've just got to have the courage and the hope to let it flow. You know, the, the old adage is, do not sit soak and sour. Do not receive while you're sitting and then just soak in it until it sours and you're no good to anyone. The idea is you receive it and you share it and you come to enjoy and treasure the fact that God is using you to love others. Verse 5 is incredible. Hope does not put us to shame. There is no shame in this because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Not dribbled, not trickled, not you know, he's not stingy with this stuff. He's poured it into our hearts. Why? That we might share. That we might bring forth fruit that will last. It is our prayer in the name of, of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.